Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 156th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission. We are here for a uh, hearing on complaints about criminalization of same-sex relationships in Grenada. Uh, the hearing has been requested by Groundation uh, Grenada and Gren uh, CHAP. Uh, and with us, I understand we have Ms. Kizian Abraham, uh, Ms. Malika Brooks-Smith Lowe, and Mr. Richie uh, Maitland. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not have representatives of the state present, uh, and so we will proceed uh, by giving a bit more time to the uh, petitioning party, something 25 to 30 minutes. Is that sufficient for initial uh, presentation followed by questions? My name is James Cavallaro. I'm the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission. I'm joined by uh, two colleagues, uh, Tracy Robinson, who is the rapporteur on uh, LGBT issues for the commission, and Felipe Gonzalez, uh, commissioner, uh, both are former presidents of the Inter-American Commission. So without more, uh, you have the floor. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you so much for having us here. It's really an honor to be here. Um, my name is Malaika Brooksmith Lowe, and I will be starting by giving a bit of background and context um, for the rest of the presentation. So Grenchap, the organization which my colleague Kizian Abraham is representing, is the Grenada chapter of the Caribbean HIV AIDS Partnership, which is a network of groups in the small Caribbean countries working to promote human rights and health with a focus on marginalized populations such as the LGBT population or lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Groundation Grenada, which Richie Maitland and myself co-founded, is a multi-issue social action collective. Um, and our focus here is section 431 of Grenada's criminal code, which criminalizes anal sex, stating that it is punishable by up to 10 years imprisonment. Um, Grenada, like many of the other Commonwealth countries, inherited this law as part and parcel of um, the colonial laws. The majority of Grenadians identify as Christian, and the legislative history of these types of laws um, established that they were ecclesiastically driven. In a paper by Professor um, Simeon McIntosh, former dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, he states, today the dominant argument against repealing the criminal laws proscribing homosexuality is the religious argument, i.e., Grenada is a Christian society, therefore the state is justified in criminalizing the practice, end quote. Despite the gender neutral iteration of section 431, it continues to underpin and drive social stigma against men who have sex with men, as opposed to say, heterosexual couples that have anal sex. We are aware that at least of at least three instances um, where men were charged under section 431, and in at least one case, the person was incarcerated for six years. Um, a 2011 study of men who have sex with men, or from now on I'll say MSM, in Grenada, um, shows that 95.7% of all the MSM surveyed were concerned about others discriminating against them because they are MSM, believing that letting others know that they were MSM is very risky. Nearly 92% of all participants were cautious about whom they told about their sexual orientation. 80% of respondents believe that MSM in Grenada were treated like outcasts and that most MSM are rejected when others find out about them. In May 2011, three, media, um, three men took to the media, including on the front page of one of Grenada's major weekly newspapers, to deny allegations of being gay. You know, they spoke about their experiences of harassment, um, of how their businesses suffered under the allegations that were being made. The stories reflect the social ostracism and discrimination which, some, which comes from being perceived, even perceived as LGBT in Grenada. Um, in a 2013 constitutional challenge against Grenada's unnatural connection laws, 
Affidavits were filed which illustrate some of the forms of discrimination that LGBT people or people perceived as such face in Grenada. Reference was made to violence, including sexual violence, to advocates being taunted, threatened, and attacked, and to a lesbian woman who called the police to report an incident of domestic, an incidence of domestic violence only to be threatened with arrest by the police who refused to take a ref report and otherwise or otherwise deal with the matter once he realized that it involved a same-sex couple. In 2013, a Seventh-day Adventist church organized a march in Grand Anse, a popular town in Grenada. In that march, members chanted things like, man to man is so unjust, woman to woman is even worse, which is a disingenuous perversion of Bob Marley's lyrics in the song Who the Cap Fit. And a 2014 UNAIDS poll study showed that although 58% of respondents say they didn't think that people should be treated differently because of sexual orientation, 38% say that they hated homosexuals, 52% say that they wouldn't hang out or spend time with homosexuals, and 46% supported retention of laws criminalizing anal sex. 64% said that sexual minorities are not in need of state protection. Now, in the midst of all these figures, I want to insert a, a voice, um, that of my younger brother, Farhan Hassani Brooks Smith Lowe. As a bisexual woman with a gay brother, you can imagine that our parents had a tough time initially, but it <laughs> But it's so amazing to be sitting here with full support of our family. It is a testament that people can interrogate their beliefs and emerge on the side of love. He, um, here is an excerpt from Hassani's affidavit, which he bravely filed as part of the 2013 constitutional challenge against this same section 431. So this is a direct quote from the affidavit. And it's just so such an amazing honor to read my brother's words. Um, Ever since I was self-aware, I have been sexually attracted to men long before I even understood what the term straight, gay, or even sexual attraction meant. I knew that I was not the same as what people around me said little boys should be. Growing up in Grenada, I encountered attitudes of disgust and confusion and have been subject to ridicule and general, general hostility about my sexual orientation. While visiting my family in December 2012, I was walking along the beach with my sister, who was then 15, and brother, who was seven, and we were enjoying each other's company and not bothering anyone when we passed a group of young men that started to shout faggot and fag and other homophobic slurs at us. Fortunately, I don't believe that they, my siblings took notice, but it hurt me and I could, that I couldn't even spend time with my family without being verbally assaulted uh, about my sexuality. I do not think that someone who is straight and fits the societal sexual norm can truly understand what it's like to be gay in Grenada. I am constantly being told that I am wrong for something as personal and harmless as who I want to kiss. To be a straight person, this might seem like an exaggeration, but a straight person has the luxury of not being able to notice these messages. Um, for example, when I hear someone describing another with negative attributes, like um, as somebody who's gay or as saying that the attributes are gay, which is very common in Grenada. They are indirectly talking about me and telling me that I am all those things. When I'm in Grenada, I'm afraid of being attacked. Although I am fortunate not to have experienced such violence, my fear is a direct result of the prevailing attitudes within the society. The current laws criminalizing homosexuality seems to justify the hate that is directed towards me, and my attraction to other men doesn't harm anyone. It should. I should be able to do with my body whatever I choose and other people should, ha should respect that. Most of all, I want to be able to share intimate moments with the man I love without the fear of police kicking down my door and arresting me for quote unquote unnatural acts when those acts feel, when those acts are what feel most natural to me. Thank you. Although working group recommendations following Grenada's most recent UPR have called for the repeal of Section 431, unfortunately our government has not accepted any. No justifiable reasons have been given either. Today, Grand Chap and Grandation are here because we represent two organizations 
that believe Section 431 of Grenada's Constitution is an encroachment on both heterosexual and homosexual persons who practice anal sex. However, according to a 2011 report by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the mere retention of legislations like Section 3431 are used to hound and indict individuals because of their actual or perceived sexuality, and by extension, this denies homosexual persons their human rights to dignity and privacy, equal protection under the law and non-discrimination, health, freedom of expression, and humane treatment and physical integrity. My colleague Richie will thoroughly detail how Section 431 violates these human rights, which are part and parcel to many of the human rights conventions our government is obliged to uphold. Conventions such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the American Convention, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, just to list a few. There is international consensus, backed by empirical research, that the criminalization of same-sex relations perpetuates, and I quote, a culture of social stigmatization, end quote, which in turn condones homophobic hate crimes, family and community violence, and the unnatural protection under the law. According to PAHO, this culture of impunity affects vulnerable communities adversely forcing countless homosexual males to live double lives, which in turn heightens their risk of exposure to sexually transmitted infections like HIV and AIDS. Mental health problems such as suicide, depression, and anxiety, drug and substance abuse, homelessness, victimization, and both physical and sexual abuse. These challenges constrain the efforts of organizations like Grandchap and Groundation working to protect the human rights of our country's LGBT community. And by extension, places a burden of accusation on public workers for aiding and abetting criminal activity. Nigel Matlin recounts some of these challenges in the affidavits made mention of earlier. Mr. Matlin states, Mr. Matlin is the president of Grandchap. Mr. Matlin states that LGBT persons in Grenada experience social exclusion, verbal and physical threats and attacks, harassment, extortion, and restricted opportunities due to discrimination. Furthermore, he has sworn at least five affidavits regarding the situation and treatment of homosexuals in Grenada in support of LGBT persons seeking asylum in the United States on the basis of persecution they face in Grenada because of their perceived sexual orientation. It should be duly noted also that applicants for asylum had experienced discriminatory and homophobic behavior, including verbal threats, physical attacks, loss of employment, and housing due to discrimination. Threats by police on duty when attempts were made to report violations and discrimination in the healthcare system, hindering access to care and treatment for persons living with HIV. In another affidavit report made mention of, one male recounts being raped following the passage of Hurricane Ivan in 2004 by a young man who had been verbally assaulting him throughout his adolescence, calling him a faggot and chichi man in public spaces. The applicant stated, when I tried to walk away, he told me that I would see a different side to him if I did not do what he told me. I was scared. He ran up to me and began slapping me and told me to take off my clothes. I remember him taking off my pants and spitting on my penis before he began to rape me. In light of these atrocities committed against LGBT persons and countless others which go unreported, faith-based organizations have used the media as a platform to spew messages that deny LGBT persons human rights to dignity and privacy and freedom of expression. My colleagues would have made earlier mention of cases um, whereby persons would have actually been prosecuted pursuant to Section 41. Um, I just wanted to call to the Commissioner's attention the actual numerical references for those cases. One of those cases is referenced as GDA HCR 
2011-0112. And that case earlier mentioned by my colleague resulted in a conviction and a consequent six year sentence. The other case is referenced as GDA HCR 2012-0105. Now, in that case, a charge was brought and the defendant pursued a constitutional motion challenging section 41. In face of that challenge, the DPP withdrew the criminal charge and the litigant no longer wished to continue with the constitutional motion, which was subsequently abandoned. In that case, at least there is no evidence of lack of consent. Now, on, na on natural connection, the offense established by section 41 is punished, as my colleague indicated, for, by imprisonment for up to 10 years. Interestingly, section 831 of the criminal code establishes the offense of unnatural carnal knowledge by force, which criminalizes anal sex without consent. This makes it clear, therefore, that section, 40, that section 41 extends the ambit of the criminal law to target the mischief, quote unquote, of consensual anal sex. Grandation, Grenada, and Grenchap are concerned that section 41 will be and is being used to prosecute consensual anal sex between adults in Grenada in breach of human rights to dignity and privacy, equal protection under the law and non-discrimination, health, and freedom of expression. We are further concerned that while not directly in breach of, Section 431 significantly contributes to an environment inimical to the full realizations of people's right to humane treatment and physical integrity. The right to dignity and privacy is guaranteed to persons under Section 11 of the American Convention on Human Rights, Article 17 of the ICCPR, and Section 1C of the Constitution of Grenada. In international cases or in, in cases brought before international tribunals, such as Atala and Chile and Tunen on Australia, international bodies have held that laws like Section 41 are in breach of people's rights to dignity and privacy. Equal protection under the law is guaranteed by sections by Articles 1 and 24 of the American Convention on Human Rights, Article 21 and 26 of the ICCPR, and Part 2 of the ICESCR. And and also by the Constitution of Grenada. A 2011 report by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights looking at discrimination and violence against LGBTI people worldwide indicates that laws like Section 41 and its analogs harass or used to harass and prosecute individuals because of their actual or perceived sexuality or gender identity. In cases like Tunen against Australia, the UN Human Rights Committee has held that references to sex in the non-discrimination section include sexual orientation. Committees like the Committee on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, um, as well as other bodies have indicated to Grenada that Section 41 um, is in fact in breach of the international obligations. Interestingly, Grenada in its 2010 report to the Working Group has indicated that in, in their view, Section 41 could be viewed as discriminatory as it took away from the freedom of, of the individual. And that's a direct quote, in fact, from Grenada's um, indications to the working group in, in, in 2010. Um, as concerns the, the right to health, Article 12 of the ICSCR establishes that everyone has the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. The Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against AIDS, PANCAP, a regional organization comprising governments and other organizations indicated in a 2014 declaration that in the Caribbean, stigma is named as the main reason for the lack of attention to marginalized groups in the prevention efforts and their general lack of access to HIV-related services. And stigmatizing and discriminatory legal and policy measures are common in regional legal systems. Now, this international consensus there's, there is, sorry, international consensus on this position, as also advocated by UNAIDS and PAHO. The Grenada National HIV AIDS Strategic Plan for 2012 to 2016 indicates that men who have sex with men, MSM, are a most at risk group. It also recognizes that targeted interventions are crucial to reducing prevalence among that group. Interventions made more difficult by laws hostile towards MSM. The plan itself says, uh, the plan itself says 
that human rights issues that are known to impede progress towards universal access will be tackled within the framework of the, exi of the existing socio-religious realities in Grenada. In the affidavit by the president of Grenchap, one of the persons who would have contributed to the 2013 constitutional challenge, um, he indicates that in a sensitivity training organized by Grenchap, and Grenchap as an organization does these sensitivity trainings, um, and that particular sensitivity training concerned healthcare workers, working with healthcare, healthcare workers around stigma and discrimination. One of the healthcare workers actually indicated that they would not um, serve LGBTI people within a professional setting because it, it affronted their religious sens sensitivities. As concerns the freedom of expression, that right is guaranteed by the Constitution of Grenada, as well as Article 13 of the American Convention. Um, while the issue has not been litigated in the Caribbean, expression is not only specific to words, but also includes behaviors, particularly where those behaviors convey meaning. And that has been held, um, in, that has been established in judgments of international courts. Now, the courts have indicated that freedom of expression also extends to form of expressions that might be regarded as, that might be regarded as offensive to some. Sexual activities engaged in by consenting adults are a manifestation of sexual preference, and depending on the sex of the participants, those sexual preferences are used, among other things, to communicate sexual orientation, sexual attraction, affection, and love. Consequently, Section 41 violates the right to freedom of expression by illegitimately curtailing that right vis-a-vis -vis consensual sexual behaviors between adults. Now, as concerns the right to humane treatment and physical integrity, that right is guaranteed by Article 5 of the American Convention, Article 7 of the ICCPR, and Section 5 of the Grenada, Constituted, of the Grenada Constitution. An earlier mentioned report from the Office of the UN High Commission on Human Rights on Criminalization and Stigma indicates that special procedures mandate holders have emphasized the link between criminalization and homophobic hate crimes, police abuse, torture, and family and community violence. The Special Rapporteur on Health noted that sanctioned punishment by states reinforces existing prejudices and legitimizes community violence and police brutality directed at affected individuals. The State Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions noted that criminalization increases social stigmatization and made people more vulnerable to violence and human rights abuses, including death threats and violations of rights to life, which are often committed in a climate of impunity. It is clear, therefore, that Section 41 directly contributes to the perpetuation of stigma and social discrimination against LGBTI people, producing a landscape inimical to their full realization and their right to humane treatment and physical integrity. Now, I just wanted to indicate, um, before I close and indicate my remarks, that Grenada is currently undergoing a process of employment legislation reform. Now, the Employment Acts of Grenada has an anti-discrimination section that includes a list of exhaustive rights that does not include sexual orientation. We think that it would be an excellent opportunity for the government of Grenada to follow what has in fact been achieved in St. Lucia in 2012 in their employment legislation where they amended the anti-discrimination section to include sexual orientation. We think that this would extend protections to LGBTI people um, in an area where they are particularly marginalized, the area of the workspace. In Grenada's 2015 UPR session, they received 16 recommendations specific to sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, these included recommendations to decriminalize Section 431, adopt anti-discrimination legislation and policies, on policies, take effective steps to combat discrimination, include sexual orientation as a prohibited category of discrimination in anti-discrimination sections, and to implement human rights awareness and anti-discrimination education programs. None were accepted, not even the relatively benign ones like, implement, like, like implementing sorry, anti-discrimination education programs. Nonetheless, nonetheless, at that session, Grenada reaffirmed its commitment to the protection of human rights and to engage its citizen on the range of human rights issues. Grenada also accepted the recommendation to establish a Paris Treaty compliant national human rights system. Very recently in September 2015, Grenada's Prime Minister at a New York town hall meeting, speaking on the issue of gay rights, said, and who am I to judge? Who am I to judge who doesn't conform to what our normal life, lifestyle is supposed to be? 
I may not agree with their life, but judgment is not for me. We need more tolerance. We need to understand that we cannot all believe in the same things, but we could work for the common good of the country. Statements like these, given their symbolic value, are extremely potent. So we would like the state of Grenada to, in fact, make more conscious efforts to make more positive statements supporting equality and condemning violence and discrimination. We also think that laws as governmental directives or normative, so that the repeal of Section 431 would be an extremely powerful signal to send and would, in fact, help to curtail the stigma and discrimination that LGBTI people face. We have already indicated that an amendment of the Employment Reform Act to include sexual orientation as a prohibited category of discrimination would be helpful. We would also love to see government engage more with civil society, to speak to civil society, to reach out to us. And we always have, we have, have a firm now commitment to working with the government. We struggle with what limited resources we can to run public campaigns and education awareness programs with the public. With government support, we can do even more work. And government has indicated, for instance, in the 2010 um, UPR work, working group report that they are in fact committed to raising awareness around the issue and that public education needs to be done around the issue. We would also like to see sexual orientation or homosexual couples included with, within the ambit of protection in the Domestic Violence Act of Grenada. Currently, no such protections are extended to LGBTI people. We'd like to take, to take the opportunity to thank the Commission for this hearing. And we too would have liked to see a representation by the government of Grenada. Um, as we have indicated, we are fully committed to dialoguing with them. You know, we are very committed to nation building. This is not about bashing the country or bashing the government. We are very interested in beginning our conversation and doing the work that will be absolutely necessary to helping to shift some of these stigmas that have existed historically, historically and culturally in Grenada. Thank you so much for the presentation. Let me begin by offering uh, the floor to Commissioner Robinson, Rapporteur for LGBT Rights of the Commission. Thank you very much, President, and thanks to Grand Chapman um, Groundations for requesting this hearing and sharing information with us. It is also our regret that the state isn't here. Um, for the Commission, the dialogue between state and civil society is exceptionally important. It's very important in the context of the rights of LGBT uh, persons. And I think this is one very important missed opportunity. And um, I hope that the state will offer us in writing a response to the hearing if for some reason, um, which we don't know yet, they were unavoidably not here so that in good faith we can continue this conversation and you have our commitment from the Rapporteurship on the Rights of LGBTI Persons to following up with the state. Um, and finding out if we can continue the dialogue which you've started. Um, can I ask a little bit more about some of the processes of law reform? There's employment law reform underway, and I endorse um, the recommendation that it include um, anti-discrimination principles relating to sexual orientation, and I would add gender identity. Um, I'd also endorse the call that domestic violence legislation could give full protection to the full range of intimate relationships we do have. Um, but I wanted to ask about the constitutional reform process and the extent to which that has been a space for conversations about um, full equality for all Grenadians. And to say how much I welcome the presence of Grenadians here and the voices of Nigel and Hassani in, in the discussion as well as a signal to your state that the people of Grenada have an investment in the answers to these questions. Um, I was interested in, I want to also endorse to say that the, the Inter-American Commission has said repeatedly um, that laws which criminalize same-sex sexual activities are discriminatory. We have called for their repeal in the Caribbean, as have international human rights bodies elsewhere. And we have also repeatedly made the link between the criminalization and stigma and social discrimination. Um, and no doubt the Commission will again make those observations in its upcoming report on violence against LGBT persons. Um, one of the 
myths about the Caribbean is that criminalization is not very harmful because no arrests take place. And there are two important messages I hear from you today. Um, one is arrests do take place. We have very poor data on arrests. Um, so in fact, in places where we've assumed there, there have been no arrests, um, very likely they, ha they, they, they may well have been. And we should make a call for the state to collect appropriate data disaggregated to allow us to understand the extent to which these laws are being used to criminalize consensual sexual activities. But even where no arrests takes, take place, as you point out, there are threats. Um, there is more impunity for crimes against LGBT persons. There is reluctance to make um, complaints to the police and to seek the protection of the police in that context. Um, you noted that there are also threats made against lesbians. Um, and that I imagine is in a context in Grenada where there isn't a specific provision um, comparable to section 431. So I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about how you understand those threats of arrests um, having force and impact um, in this generalized context of um, fear and insecurity, even as things begin to change and we hear mixed views in that UNAIDS survey. Um, I wanted to also ask, even though this is not um, directly in your purview about criminalization of trans persons, um, whether you have any information on criminalization, not through section 431, but minor offenses relating to vagrancy, um, solicitation or other crimes, which may also indirectly criminalize LGBTI persons in Grenada, if you have any information. I also want to say that the LGBTI rapporteurship has noted positive statements from political leaders in the English-speaking Caribbean over the last four years, unprecedented, and by high-level officials, prime ministers, who am I to judge? We need to be more tolerant. What I have to say, and I regret that at the end of my mandate, we haven't seen that translated into executive action, DPPs declaring moratoriums on prosecutions, um, public documents by police forces indicating affirmatively their duty to protect and making clear where complaints can be made if the police fail to do their jobs. In other words, the executive can do more. And then also thinking through how do state officials advance the public debate in a responsible fashion so that the question of legislative reform can be considered at an appropriate moment. And so I think there's an important need to move beyond what is an important step for the English-speaking Caribbean, which is progressive statements by political leaders, um, which need to be made at home as well as um, elsewhere into e executive actions which transform and potentially can transform the respect and the regard for the rights of LGBTI persons, and then ultimately legislative action. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Gonzalez, uh, uh, let me add <coughs> one brief question to the uh, comments, observations, and questions that Commissioner Robinson has raised. I understand the difference between Section 431 and, if I'm not wrong, Section 831, which involves lack of consent, which by force. Uh, and I'm curious about one of the cases, and I may have the number wrong, but I think it's 2011-0112, GDH, and maybe there are other initials. But this is the case in which uh, there was a conviction and a six-year sentence applied. Uh, if you could clarify, and maybe not now, but subsequently in writing, uh, am I correct in understanding that the only charge was a Section 431 violation that led to a six-year sentence, one, and then two, was there any uh, issue of l consent or lack of consent by age or otherwise in that case? Or is this a case with consenting persons over the age of consent or what would be the age of consent for females in which a person is still in prison serving a six year sentence? So I would just like to know more about that particular case if you could, thank you so much. And uh, <clears throat> why don't we say 10 minutes to respond please?
Okay, so perhaps starting with the, the constitutional reform issue. No, it's true, in fact, that Grenada is not only currently undergoing um, employment legislation related reform, but also constitutional reform. We are actually on our third attempt at constitutional reform since our independence and since we've received the 1974 independence constitution. Um, there have been nationwide con consultations, and actually Grand Nation, Grenada, and Grand Chap used the opportunity to make written submissions to the, um, the, the Constitutional Ad Advisory Reform Commission. Now, what they did was invited us to the largest public hearing ever to pitch it publicly. The argument, well, was the, it, it requires a referendum in Grenada, so sell your case to the people, essentially. Now, other persons who would have made written contributions were not invited to sell their case, essentially. I think that what they, they, they thought is that we would have sort of shied away from the challenge. But um, we actually went. Uh, it was held in the in the trade center. It was packed, a very full full room of thousands of people, and the, it, the, it was live cast across the nation. And we made our pitch um, to the nation um, amidst uproar. A, a few times in the crowd, you know, there was significant uproar. Um, and it was the first time that this really became a public issue in Grenada. I mean, there would have been a few discussions here and there, particularly on social media, but it has never really formed part of the public narrative, LGBTI issues. So this was the very first time. And what it did was inspire a conversation where, in my view, there was, a, there was opportunity to unpack a lot of the misconceptions. Because in our view, that is the most important thing that, com that comes out of this. You know, we see what the UN aid study show. Um, that you know, perhaps if it goes to, to in, in, indeed a referendum, it might not be passed, but at least we use the opportunity to sort of begin the conversation. And just coming out of that, there were newspaper articles and responses to those articles, debates raging across social media. So just a lot of discussion and discussions where there was an engagement and an unpacking of old conceptions. Um, so in, in our view, that was one of the very positive things that came out. Ultimately, the, the, our proposals, which were to add sexual orientation and gender, and, and gender identity in the anti-discrimination section of the Bill of Rights, were not submitted to cabinet. Um, in a subsequent meeting with one of the commissioners, we had indicated to them that perhaps what, what we can do is add other status, which of course would not extend protections to only LGBTI people, but a range of persons who at the time were not necessarily conceived of when thinking about anti-discrimination sections. Um, they saw the merit in it. It would have been more palatable to people, for instance. You know, they would not have been the kind of opposition that people would have had to a more or less exclusive, um, LGBTI exclu exclusive provision, so they would have been more uh, of a possibility for it to pass. But that too has not been submitted to, to cabinet, the, the other status addition. Um, so we just wait and see ultimately what happens. Um, right now we are at the stage of, well, I don't know if they've, if they've finished consultations necessarily, but since October last year, there hasn't been, in, in, as far as I know, any, any, any consultations. Um, and I don't know if my other colleagues might have more to add about that constitutional reform process. One, one of the things I want to say though, that was very telling in my view is that at the start of our presentation, at the constitutional reform um, consultations. Once the crowd realized that we were going to speak about LGBTI issues, you know, there was this huge uproar. And throughout our presentation, you could actually feel the mood of the room shift. You could actually hear splatterings of applause here and there and a light applause at the end of the segment. And there were moments where you really see that we were able to connect with the crowd. So that is where I, th I really think it's important for governments to engage civil society because I think that as nations, we are ready to have that conversation. You know, we've been saying 10 years now, well, okay, we're not going to change anything. It's a conversation we need to have, but nothing is really being done around driving that conversation. So we really would like to press Caribbean governments to really engage civil society on that. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to add, because I presented alongside Richie for that um, national presentation, and I may have been naive in not assuming that there would be a response from the crowd, um, but I think what struck me most was what happened afterwards, which was that from the moment I sat back down on the stage, I was receiving messages. The first message I received was from a fellow um, artist who uh, she was sitting and watching it with her parents. And she said, we're here watching you and I just wanna let you know that we support you 100%. And over and over again, over the next few weeks, I was getting calls from my dad about colleagues. You know, there was this way that, this assumption that a particular generation of Grenadians would be so close-minded was being shattered by the responses that I got 
afterwards. And yeah. I think that that was really striking because the audience for that was not, the audience for that was not um, people of our generation. It was another generation. And what we were hearing were people who were open to this conversation because we were talking about this, being able to have everyone live a life that was equal. The other thing I want to add is, um, you know, the point that we continue to try to make is that sexuality that doesn't fit the norm is not something that is foreign to Grenada. And also um, that homophobia is not something that is necessarily intrinsically Grenadian either. And that if we start to look back in, in our history, there are so many times where LGBT people were embraced in the community. And so that this kind of oppositional homophobia is something that actually is quite new in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think that was another kind of aspect of the, the dialogue that came out of it that was quite refreshing in terms of the constitutional reform. Yeah. Um, as to the, the other question concerning the, the police arriving at the, the home of the person who had called in, in relation to a, a domestic violence report and threatening to arrest them. Now, it is correct that Grenada doesn't have laws criminalizing um, lesbian sexual behaviors per se. Um, I think what, what would have happened is that whoever the, the arresting or attending police officer at the time would have been, you know, I, I don't think he would have been too mindful of what exactly the laws were. So in his mind, homosexuality is criminalized, you know, which sort of just serves to, to, to emphasize what is the, the, the kind of in international professional consensus around this, these issues, which is that although in some countries the law on the face of it applies equal to, equally to heterosexuals and homosexuals, in fact, what it serves to do is drive stigma particularly against, LGB, um, against LGBTI people. So I think that that, that was quite um, instructive. Now, as per the case where the person is, is serving six years. And in, in all fairness, that was a case which where there, there was evidence of um, non of, of lack of consent. The the virtual complainant was above the age of, of consent, which in Grenada is 16. I believe he would have been 17 at the time. And there was, in fact, some evidence of lack of coercion as to why the, the person would have been charged under Section 431 is the question, because um, he was in fact charged and, and convicted pursuant to Section 431. But in that case, there was in fact some evidence of um, consent issues. Yes. So uh, might it be because it's easier for a prosecutor to not have to demonstrate lack of consent? They can raise the issue and rely on 431 as a, a legal figure that uh, facilitates conviction. J I just, I'm supposing, but I don't know, I'm asking you. Yes, yes, it, it may in fact um, be the case. No, we, we're not parrying in this necessarily as the, the, the perfect sort of Section 41 case because we understand the, the sort of factual limitations of that case. But in the other case, the other the case which, which inspired the constitutional challenge, there was no evidence of lack of consent in, in that one. The charge was brought. Um, I was part of the research team that was dealing with the the constitutional challenge. And in response to the challenge that was brought, the DPP would, withdrew the charges against the person. So it's not a case where, for instance, you know, it is simply used because it's it's easier to sort of prosecute evidentially, but the state would not use it against against persons where there isn't consent issues. Oh, um, Grandation at least, I can't speak for Grand Chapel, but Grandation at least doesn't have a lot of information as regards trans persons in Grenada. So I'm sorry I'm unable to provide more information. I think we might. Uh, thank you again, uh, both institutions and all three of you individually uh, for the information, which is of, of great use and relevance to the commission, uh, both uh, with regard to Grenada, but more generally in, in, in the region. Uh, again, the, the commission will follow up to see uh, why, unfortunately, the state representatives were not present. Uh, our thanks, and with that, we conclude this session.